Welcome, everyone. We'll be starting in just a few more minutes. We'll give a chance for everybody to get into the from the waiting room. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Welcome again, everyone. We're going to be starting in about a minute or two, as soon as more people come in from the waiting room. Just another few minutes and we will be getting started. Okay, I think we can get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Phyllis Bennis. I'm here at the Institute for Policy Studies and the director of the New Internationalism Project with my colleague, Karee Peterson-Smith, who I'll introduce in a moment. And today we're pulling together this emergency webinar to look at the emergency situation developing in the Middle East with major escalations underway in a number of venues across the region in which, as has happened so many times before, actions of the United States in the name of stability in the name of making sure that things don't spread is actually, of course, making things much worse. Today, we're going to focus particularly on the U.S. strikes against Yemen, looking both at the internal situation in Yemen, the poorest country in the Arab world, uh, a country with a, a long and, and storied extraordinary history and a difficult history of division and then reunification, challenges throughout the Arab Spring, uh, what was called not too long ago, just a few months ago, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world until the crisis in Gaza erupted. And of course, in this context of looking at the region and U.S. policy in the region, we know that the crisis in Gaza remains central. The demand for a ceasefire in Gaza remains the central demand for not only Palestinians, but for people around the world. And the urgency of stopping that genocide and having any hope of diplomacy instead of war as a way of dealing with the rising militarism and rising escalations going on across the region, all hinge on a ceasefire in Gaza. So that remains central to what we will be talking about today. I'm very glad to introduce my partner and colleague in the project here at IPS, Karee Peterson-Smith, who is the Michael Ratner Fellow on the Middle East in our project. And he will be introducing our speakers for today and taking over with Q&A and all the explanations needed. So take it over, Kari, and thank you all. Welcome again for coming. Thank you, Phyllis. And yes, thank you all for joining us in this really timely and urgent conversation. Uh, we are going to uh, have a conversation about Yemen primarily, which I'll say more about momentarily. But the last part of our hour will be a policy update on what's happening on the Hill uh, regarding Gaza uh, regarding US policy toward the Middle East. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. But we wanna start of course with Yemen where the US has carried out multiple airstrikes over the past week, uh, as Phyllis said in the context of course the, of the ongoing catastrophe in Gaza. 
Um, and so we in the U.S. really need to figure out what to do. And we are so lucky to have Shreen Alademi, uh, who writes and speaks extensively uh, and offers commentary for news media and briefings uh, for activists and advocates like us on this call regarding Yemen uh, and U.S. policy toward Yemen. So thank you so much for joining us, Shireen. It's good to be here with you. Um, okay, so unfortunately, just to get us started, the, the U.S. mainstream media only discuss Yemen where there's when there's a particularly acute crisis there. Most of us don't get coverage or a sense of what's happening in Yemeni society and politics between moments like this one. So let's start with some context of what preceded the latest U.S. bombings. There has been a civil war in Yemen since 2014, um, when the Houthi movement deposed the president uh, Hadi and took control of the capital Sana'a. Saudi Arabia, with extensive U.S. backing, then intervened heavily, carrying out a horrific war of aerial bombardment and economic blockade. And this resulted in, as, as Phyllis said, among other things, what the U.N. called the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe until the current situation in Gaza. Um, in terms of Yemen, clearly the Houthis have survived the Saudi onslaught. Just wondering if you could start us by, by talking about where that's at. Is the civil war over? And what is the state of negotiations with Saudi Arabia? Um, yeah, so the war is not over, um, but I also wouldn't characterize it as a civil war given the foreign intervention that has uh, existed since 2015. So yes, it started off as uh, a civil conflict that didn't quite blow up into a war until Saudi Arabia began bombing in March of 2015. And so since then, um, the Houthis were in survival mode. Initially, they partnered up with their long-term enemy, the ex-president Ali Abdullah Saleh. And that lasted about two and a half years before he you know, switched sides to Saudi Arabia and the UAE and he was killed. And so then since late 2017, they've been seen as the ones who were defending essentially Yemen um, from foreign aggression led by Saudi Arabia, the UAE with extensive military support from the US and the UK. Uh, and because of that, and because of how people began to see them, uh, within Yemen, they grew, and whatever goals the Saudi coalition had to curtail their influence, to limit them, sorry, my bird just flew over into the laptop, um, they, in fact, just became stronger and um, gained much popularity throughout the, la the last several years. They are the de facto rulers of northern Yemen. Northern Yemen is where about 70 to 80 percent of the population resides, and so this is not a uh, an insignificant control that they have over Yemen. And um, the Saudis, I think, saw the writing on the wall, wall a little too late, however. And since 2022, they began negotiations, direct negotiations with the Houthis um, that eventually led to a truce and a, you know, kind of an unstable, shaky ceasefire. But the Saudis also dismissed the president that they said that they were fighting on, you know, on whose behalf they said they were fighting. So President Hadi was essentially set aside by the Saudis and replaced with a council of eight people, four of whom are loyal to the Saudis, four are loyal to the UAE. Many of them are warlords. And as one would expect, the council has been waging fights amongst each other because they have different goals. Some are uh, secessionists, for example. So in the context of all of that, the Houthis have been able to speak to the Saudis directly. And before all of these disruptions in the Red Sea began, there were talks of potentially finalizing an agreement in January in this month between them and the Saudis. The Saudis are desperate to get out of the war. They've not been able to control any territory that the Houthis have controlled since 2015. They've not been able to reinstate their puppet government, essentially. Um, and have been losing a lot of money. And, you know, they have their vision 2020, 2030 that they want to achieve. And so um, they have been motivated by all of those factors to sit down and to resolve the issue with the Houthis. So this, the latest attacks are seriously disrupting this process of, of resolution. Is that is that what I'm hearing you say? Potentially. Um, the U.S., there have been reports from The Intercept and others that the U.S. was seen as already disrupting the peace process between Saudi and the UA and uh, Saudi and uh, and the Houthis and Ansarullah. Um, but and Saudi has been, you know, voicing kind of their concern about the escalation when 
the U.S. began bombing Yemen more recently, which is, again, is just mind boggling, given that they've been engaged in that for, for nearly a decade now. Um, but potentially this could be disrupted and the peace process could be disrupted because, of course, the Saudis are a strong ally of the United States and uh, their interests are intertwined. Right. This is already um, so rich and helpful, Shireen. And I just want to say to folks uh, in the audience, we have the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And so if you have questions, I, I have a few more questions for Shireen, um, but we will open up for Q&A uh, after that. And so if you have questions for Shireen, please go ahead and uh, drop those in the Q&A uh, box. So um, thank you for that. Uh, so in terms of the... Uh, Houthi attacks on the commercial ships in the Red Sea. Um, the, they have referred to the Israeli bombardment of Gaza, of course, as justification for those attacks. And um, my just thinking, again, returning to the question of Gaza and Palestine and where it fits in in all of this, my understanding is that today there was another massive demonstration for Palestine in Sana'a um, and actually uh, demonstrations across the country um, could you talk about the significance of Palestine and Yemeni society and politics? Um, and uh, secondarily, uh, that the question of, of the Houthis' actions, clearly Palestine is part of it. Are there other motivations that, that also explain um, the, uh, their attacks? The, yes, massive demonstrations today in Sana'a and in other provinces that we've seen over and over again the last several years, essentially, but um, more explicitly the last several weeks, given what's happening in, in Palestine and Gaza specifically. But uh, Yemeni support for the Palestinian cause and Palestinians themselves is not inauthentic. It's uh, part of who we are as a nation. Um, and not just the people, I mean, many Arab most Arabs, I would say, support the Palestinian cause and see it for what it is. Um, but their governments don't re necessarily represent the will of their people. In the case of Yemen, no matter what government we had in power, they extended moral and material support to the Palestinians and their cause. Um, whether it was the communists in South Yemen in the you know in the seventies, uh, closing Bab al Mandeb essentially like just much just as the Houthis are doing now to protest the seventy three war or to to lend support for the nineteen seventy three war in uh, Palestine, or um, Ali Abdullah Saleh, our long term dictator, uh, inviting members of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberal Liberation Movement. Um, to come to Yemen and to reside in Yemen for a time after they were expelled from Lebanon during that civil war uh, or many other events. So no matter the leadership that we've had in Yemen, there's always been a synergy between this notion that the Palestinians are supported in Yemen by our people, by the Yemeni people, and also the expectation that our government will follow through. Um, you know, for example, Palestinians even working in Yemen had access to jobs the same way Yemeni citizens did. And, you know, they weren't expected to live in refugee camps, for example, or, you know, be born as a refugee. Uh, I myself had neighbors growing up in Yemen who were Palestinians. And so the... Um, this is not this is a deep seated deep seated you know commitment to the Palestinian cause that I don't think is inauthentic. Now people will say that the Houthis are trying to exploit that to for their own gains, but I also have to note that there's a lot to lose. There's a peace process that the Houthis have pushed for um, since day one. There's uh, these are not people who have nothing to lose. Bomb us anyway. That is not the case in Yemen. There's much to lose. There is a you know, a stability essentially to be gained from this peace process with the Saudis um, and their actions in the Red Sea clearly will destabilize potentially this process, but they're doing it anyway. And so, um, yes, they may have ulterior motives. Yes, of course, this has garnered them even wider support. We're seeing now people who are Yemenis who are on the side of the coalition against the Houthis are now saying, actually, we support what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea. Not all, not all of them, of course, I won't speak for the Yemeni population, but we see some of that happening um, politically, publicly. And um, so there's a bit of that. They, they are seen as the one, re one power in the region or one of very few who are actually responding and trying to support the Palestinians as they're going through a genocide. Um, but there's a lot to lose in Yemen, and uh, this doesn't come without a lot of risk for Yemen and for the Houthis themselves. Thank you. Um, super, super clarifying and helpful. Um, 
thinking about the conversation here <laughs> in the United States, um, you know, we cannot hear the name Houthis in the U.S. without it being preceded by Iran-backed. Um, we only hear about the Iran-backed Houthis uh, in the mainstream media, from U.S. officials and so on. And this suggests, among other things, that the Houthis are not a force native to Yemen, um, but are this machination of Tehran. I wonder if you could talk a bit about what is the actual relationship between the Houthi movement and Iran? I think people who say that, I mean, we could we can be generous and say that it comes out of ignorance, uh, or we could think of it as a very nefarious connection to make, because of course we, as Americans especially, have been conditioned to think Iran equals bad in all contexts, no matter what. And so it's... Um, you know, adds that fear factor, if you will. Um, but it also betrays, you know, if, if it is coming out of ignorance and if it is coming from the highest, you know, places of power, then it speaks to the complete misunderstanding and misguidance when it comes to dealing with Yemen in any way, shape or form in the international front. Um, Yemenis are, Houthis are Yemenis. They are not an import from somewhere else. They are not proxies of Iran or anywhere, anyone else. Um, they are not even a minority within Yemen, if we want to talk about religious minorities, for example, which is sometimes how they're cast as this religious minority group. They come from or they follow a sect of Shia Islam called Zaydi Islam, but so does 40 percent of the Yemeni population, including our former president, Saleh, whom, with whom they fought for you know a number of years between 2000 and six different wars between 2004 and 2010. He killed their leader. That was not a sectarian conflict. So we can't look at look at it from a sectarian lens. We can't look at it from a you know proxy war lens. Uh, they're independent of Iran. Of course, they have a positive relationship with Iran. Why would they not when they've been you know kind of cornered into that as well? There were some relationships before, and they're stronger even now when essentially all of their neighbors ganged up against them, except for Oman and uh, and Iran. And so um, the other, I think. Um, misunderstanding is how much support, how much material support they're getting from Iran. Whatever support they're getting has to be minimal, just logically speaking, given that the country was under blockade for nine years and there's still restrictions. The Saudis are still approving what ships go in and out of Yemen to deliver fuel, to deliver aid, to deliver medicine, to for people to come in and out of Yemen. There's one airport now in Sana'a airport finally started functioning um, in 2022. And uh, it only operates one flight out of Jordan, you know, from Jordan to Sana'a, back to Sana'a to Jordan a couple of times a week. And that's it. And they still have to get permission from the Saudis for the passports for all of that. And so to think that Iranians are somehow magically dropping these weapons into an airspace and a naval, you know, um, into these ports that have been heavily patrolled and policed and blockaded by the Saudi-led coalition, uh, it just doesn't make much sense. But they do enjoy that support. And, and I think if we're going to say that they're Iran-backed Houthis, we should absolutely be saying, you know, U.S.-backed Saudis, U.S.-fueled, you know, U.S.-controlled Saudis, whatever. Like the, the amount of support from, that the Saudis received, that the UAE received from the United States, the U.K., several other countries, far outweighs whatever support that the Houthis may have had from Iran. But, you know, language is used here to distort what's happening. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I see lots of questions going in the Q&A box, so we'll get to those shortly. I just have a couple more of my own. And, um, and again, this is so helpful, Shireen. Uh, I want to turn back to the, the U.S. Uh, airstrikes and ask, what do we know about their impact? Um, do we know what casualties they've caused? Um, what do we know about their impact on the Houthis' military capability? Clearly, you know, the, 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 the Houthis are still carrying out military operations, but just wondering about the impact of these, these uh, bombings. They don't seem to have been um, very uh, impactful. Um, again, I'm not sure because this is uh, what the U.S. is saying versus what the Houthis are saying, and you don't quite know, like each one has a reason to not be as transparent or as clear with what they're saying. But what the United States is saying is that they've targeted weapon depots and uh, Houthi targets, but they've also targeted airports. So Hodeida Airport and Sana'a Airport. Like I said, these airports just started functioning. Sana'a Airport just started functioning in 2022 after uh, all of these years of it being disabled. 
And so for them to target that airport, I think um, is, uh, you know, we can't just call that a Houthi target anymore. That's, that's an attack on the Yemeni people and their capabilities to travel in and out of the country in such desperate times. Um, the Houthis, on the other hand, have said that whatever that they whatever the uh, U.S. and U.K. airstrikes targeted are minimal. They they've seen repeat attacks on the same targets. Um, they're saying that they don't actually have all of their equipment stored in those areas. So maybe it's based on old intelligence. Again, the Saudis have not been able to control Sana'a or anywhere, you know, in that region in northern Yemen for many years. So they may be operating based on. Um, several decade long, you know, intelligence from a decade, a decade ago. Um, there was some mention of uh, bombing the port city of the Mar. The Mar is nowhere near the, the sea. So, um, but there have been some casualties, I think maybe a dozen or so casualties, as far as I know, uh, and unclear how many of those were civilian versus military targets. Okay. Thank you. And then, yeah, just related, um, just to go a little deeper, um, just curious about what we know about the significance of these airstrikes at the moment in Yemeni society. Um, how are they being discussed? Um, what are the implications for Yemeni politics, for the Houthis' ability to govern, things like that? Uh, the response, I think, generally has been one that's defiant. So they know that they've been bombed by the United States over the last several years, but through the Saudis. Like the U.S. wasn't you know, they weren't flying their own planes and dropping bombs. They were training the Saudis to drop U.S. bombs that were on targets that were chosen by the United States. And so it's a it's a bit of a difference, a little bit of a qualitative difference between who they've been bombed before and, you know, who's bombing them now. Uh, but they see this as a direct confrontation, of course, as as one could imagine. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say people are used to war because nobody could be used to war. Uh, but they find themselves in that reality again, which has been their reality for the last decade or so. And um, the leadership, at least, is, has been defined, and the Yemeni population has been defined. You see these protests, nobody's forcing 5 million people to show up on the streets and protests, right? You couldn't possibly do that. Um, and so they're showing their solidarity with Palestine. They're saying that this strengthens their resolve and that it wouldn't scare them into just giving up. Uh, just today, President Biden was asked about the Houthi, um, the US strikes against the Houthi and he, his response was just baffling. He said, um, you know, is it, is it stopping the attacks? No, are the attacks, are, are we continue, are we gonna continue to bomb them? Yes. And so he knows that these US attacks, these US strikes are not going to change the situation. It's only going to escalate. And the Houthis have responded by saying, well, we were trying to blockade ships going to Israel before, and now we're going to target ships that are, you know, either Israeli, American, or British. And so it's definitely expanded um, the list of targets, so, so to speak. Thank you, uh, Shireen. Um, we're going to get into the the questions from the, um, the Q&A box, and just starting with this one, actually, about the, the decade or so. Um, of um, really horrific war and uh, um, the blockade, et cetera. Uh, Rebecca asks, it says, thank you, Shireen. Can you say something about the levels of displacement, hunger, and other kinds of deprivation presently experienced by Houthis? Or I'm sorry, excuse me, by Yemenis. Yes. Um, they're still widespread. So just because the you know airport now can allow people to travel to Jordan, these are the people who can really afford to travel to Jordan. Jordan is uh, not a cheap place to live. Um, so those seeking medical treatments and who can afford the costs of the visa and who can afford the cost of living abroad while their loved one gets treated, those are the people who are able to take these flights out of Yemen. So uh, internal displacement still remains um, uh, massive. You know, these homes that have been bombed by the Saudi-led coalition have not been rebuilt. The aid coming in has been curtailed now because of all of this that's happening and the designation of the Houthis as terrorists by the United States will only influence uh, that even more, right? Like if we're not going to be able to send money back home, then that's going to influence even more people on the ground. If um, Western Union or whatever, you know, um, stops transacting with Houthi controlled areas. Um, so the potential for the crisis to get even larger than it is, is eminent and it's, and it's real. But also, you know, um, salaries have still not been paid. That's part of the negotiation with the Saudi-led 
coalition that has not been finalized yet using oil revenues to pay for people's for civil servant salaries who, who have not been paid since 2016. Um, yet our oil exports are just go straight into the pockets of Saudi Arabia or their cronies, you know, in the coalition. Um, the um, Yemenis are still not free to resume trade the way they used to without having these restrictions. I mean, nobody's asking why is the US there anyway? What are these US, you know, warships doing in Yemen's backyard, 8,000 miles away from home, right? So there's this constant policing of that region, of that area. Um, and the way the Houthis are being able to even attack these, it's it's hit or miss. They're using small fishing boats. They're using whatever missiles that they have left over in Yemen. Um, they're not using any sophisticated technology to try to get to these, you know, to these targets. Um, but the reality is that people on the ground are still suffering. You know, we see these massive demonstrations in cities, but there are also villages and rural areas and places where uh, fifty percent of the population still doesn't have access to healthcare or clean water. Um, so the suffering is still there, and it's only going to get worse if this designation is not uh, revoked. Yeah, thank you so much for putting that designation um, on the table as something that we really, we in the U.S. really have to engage with, kind of the re-putting of um, the Houthis on the the U.S.'s list of uh, so-called terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we've got. Um, uh, a question from Kate um, that I'm going to read. Solidarity with Palestine seems to be one of the only things that both Saudi Arabia and the Houthis agree on. How does Houthi solidarity with Palestine and their global popularity impact the peace process with Houthis and the Saudi-led coalition, uh, which the UN envoy had said was restarting? The U.S. has supported that peace process in the past, but how do our actions on the Red Sea change our role in supporting that process? Um, I would say that the Saudi government's stance on um, Palestinian solidarity, I would say, is very superficial. They have been in talks to normalize relationships with, with uh, Israel um, prior to the October 7th attacks. Of course, these normalization talks leave out Palestinians altogether. It has nothing to do with Palestinians. Palestinians are not considered in that at all. We've seen how that normalization played out with the UAE between the UAE and Israel for example Palestinians are not a consideration at all when it comes to these this is just an economic partnership essentially between these Gulf countries and Israel um and uh to say that they are you know that they share maybe the people of Saudi Arabia do but we know that they're not represented by their absolute monarchies that represent you know that govern them and so um, I I think the Saudis, I've also heard their foreign minister say recently that if the attacks on Gaza stop, then they'll resume normalization talks with Israel. Um, and so they're trying to, I think, just put out a fire here to make, they can't outright be on the same, um, you know, they can't be seen as supporting the Israelis in any way, shape or form, but they also don't want to mess up the potential for having their, you know, normalization talks go through. Uh, because it's in their own economic interest to do so. And they've allowed the U.S. to use their airspace to bomb Yemenis in response to to the um, to the Red Sea attacks. So I don't think this is a, a point of, um, you know, they're not really in agreement here. But I worry that the talks, again, are going to be disruptive, not because Saudi Arabia doesn't want to continue the talks, but because it, as a partner to the United States, they, they don't want to be implicated here as seen as making peace with what the U.S. is now calling a terrorist group. Right, um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, another question from from Kate, um, and you just spoke to how the the so called normalization deal <clears throat> between Saudi and um, and in Israel, brokered by the United States, uh, would impact Palestine. And I think this one gets to the, the the potential impact on Yemen. So I'll just read. There are recent reports that Brett McGurk is circulating a plan to revive the Saudi-Israel-U.S. deal by asking Saudi to eventually give funds to rebuild Gaza. How do you respond to McGurk's priorities here, and what the impacts of the Saudi-Israel uh, normalization would have on Yemen. I don't think there would be any impact on um, Saudi-Israel norm normalization on Yemen. I think Yemen is trying to desperately to free itself from any uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia because that relationship has been toxic for decades. This is not just we're not just talking about 2014 to now. 
um, Saudi Arabia has had a negative impact on Yemen and Yemeni politics uh, for several, several decades, whether it was supporting the monarchy that Yemenis were trying to overthrow in the 60s or, you know, um, supporting different factions in various civil wars through the 90s. Um, Yemen wants nothing to do with Saudi Arabia and what they do. Uh, but I also think that, um, you know, McGurk is interested in, in, in Israel and U.S. interests. Um, Saudi Arabia is interested in their own, you know, uh, agenda. I don't think Yemenis or Palestinians factor in here at all. Thank you. Um, this is a question from David, uh, just referring to what you said about Biden saying on one hand that they knew that the, the airstrikes were not stopping the Houthis and yet those that those strikes would continue. Um, the question is, what is the U.S.'s agenda in carrying out those strikes that won't stop the, the Houthis? Uh, I would love to know that and, you know, the answer to that question as well, because uh, we have Obama Biden who bombed Yemen for many years alongside the Saudis. Nothing changed. The Houthis became stronger. Um, Trump continued that policy. And then Biden said that he was changing the war from offensive to defensive. Again, nobody attacked the U.S., so this is not a defensive war. And things went on as usual under the pretense of trying to stop the war until the Yemenis and the Saudis started talking directly with one another to try to solve their own problems directly, um, only to now resume and to start hitting Yemeni you know, uh, cities again. So he knows it's not going to solve anything. It's a show of force. Biden has never met a war he does not like. He's never met a conflict that he doesn't want to turn into a war. This is how he responds, whether it's in Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, in Syria and Yemen. Um, this is just part of the parcel of uh, U.S. foreign policy under Biden specifically, and of course, other presidents as well. Um, so I don't, I mean, he clearly knows this is not going to work. He's going to do it anyway. And, uh, and think that he's completely justified in doing so, even though, you know, he's sending people 8,000 miles away to supposedly defend the United States from the Houthis. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Was the Saudi intervention in Yemen religiously based? Not at all. Um, I referenced a couple of times the 1960s when we had a monarchy in the north and there was a... Um, uh, a coup essentially against the monarchy. Republican soldiers were trying to um, dethrone the the third generation of the the kings over there, and um, Saudi Arabia intervened on behalf of the monarchy for eight years. For eight years, they continued to support the deposed king to try to get him back to uh, take leadership over Yemen. Now he was a Zaidi Muslim, just like the Houthis are. Saudi Arabia, is, or Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, practices, you know, Salafi Wahhabism, which is a very different, it's it's actually what the Houthis began speaking out against in the 90s, the, this import of Wahhabi Islam to, uh, to Yemen. And so their interest really at the end of the day is geopolitical. They don't want their neighbor to have any kind of democratic system when they themselves are an absolute monarchy. The entire Gulf region is an, is an absolute monarchy except for Yemen. So you have Oman, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, uh, and the UAE. These are all absolute monarchies. Yemen is the only country in that region that is not. And Saudi Arabia has always had an interest in kind of like, if they're not going to turn them into a monarchy, to at least have a puppet government there that will serve Saudi interests. So it's a matter of serving Saudi interests because when we see Bab al Mandeb Strait, you know, uh, six percent of Saudi oil goes through Bab and Mandeb Strait, and so um, it's very strategic location. And they wanted to make sure that the government there is at least friendly to Saudi Arabia, if not serving its own interest. And their intervention has everything to do with that, and absolutely nothing to do with sectarianism. No matter what you hear the Saudis saying. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. This is a question from Maryam, uh, and it. it goes again to the question of the um, relationship between Iran and, and the Houthis, which you spoke to, um, particularly in terms of the kind of material relationship and pointing out, you know, the absurdity of the claim that that there's this flow of weapons um, from Iran to a country that is under severe blockade. Um, but I'm just going to, to, to read this to um, ask to dig a little deeper or, or um, say a bit more. Um, thank you for a great conversation. I think a major concern with the quote unquote Iran backed Houthi statement is that uh, it implies the Houthis are acting as a foreign agent of Iran, but is that true? 
are the Houthis actually getting orders from Iran? Or does Iran simply fund them, provide limited support, et cetera? Uh, but the actions of the Houthis are independent of Iran? Absolutely independent of Iran. They're not proxies of Iran. They couldn't care less what Iran has to say, especially, and, and in key moments, we know that they could not care less what Iran had to say. And one key moment, the, the thing that ignited all of this was September 21st, 2024, when the Houthis marched themselves all the way from Northern Yemen to the capital, Sana'a, took over, placed the president under house arrest, and he fled to Saudi Arabia before he knew it, Saudi Arabia started bombing. Now, Iran went and said, you know, Houthis, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, probably not a good idea. And the Houthi res public, public response was, don't tell us what to do. We don't really care what you have to say about this. Now, this is the key moment that turned everything upside down. And yet they had this very public spat where the Houthis were very indignant about Iranians telling them what to do. So um, I think it's a convenient narrative to say that um, Iran is just this puppet master that controls everybody who has who does anything that's anti-US or anti, you know, Saudi, Saudi in the region without understanding the local factors that give rise to these uprisings. Um, then, you know, it remains this very superficial kind of understanding of the entire region. Um, we don't share a language with Iran. We don't share any borders with Iran. We don't even share the same sect of religion as Iran. Um, there, there's moral support from, from Iranians. There's allyship, like I said earlier. Um, there's probably clearly some funding and some logistical support by the Iranians, maybe limited uh, weapons by the Iranians, but the relationship has been overblown and the Houthis are independent. They've always had their independent causes. And they emerged in the late 90s, early 2000s in response to factors that were influencing them and all Yemenis within Yemen. And those two factors were U.S. intervention in Yemen, where we had uh, President Bush just coming in and bombing whenever he wanted, um, and his strong relationship with our dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And the other issue was the encroachment of Saudi Wahhabism into Yemeni society and trying to tear away that fabric of um, you know Yemeni society that we, we've had we've enjoyed in Yemen for several thousand years, and those were the two key factors that the Houthis were speaking out against, and this is how they got themselves in trouble with the Yemeni government. Um, but I think the relationship with Iran is um, it's there, but it's not to the extent that we hear about. Thank you, Shireen. Yeah, the the contrast between um, that rich sort of historical context and explanation versus, you know, Iran back Houthis <laughs> really couldn't be clearer. So thank you so much for that. Um, this is a, another question from David. What is Yemen's relation with the global South and how might these relations provide support for Yemen in the context of US and Israeli aggression? I think that's a really good question and maybe it's yet to be seen uh, what happens with global South countries. Now, nobody has recognized the Houthis as an independent government. They're recognized as the de facto government in Northern Yemen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to issue passports. They wouldn't be in direct negotiation with the Saudis to end this war. Uh, there's no plan to replace them with anybody else in Northern Yemen. They've already tried that for the last several years and failed. Um, but I think, um, I've noticed an increase in these connections that the Houthis themselves are making to the Global South to kind of try to build solidarity with um, members of the Global South who have been impacted by U.S. interventions, whether in South America or in East Asia, for example. Um, and, you know, they've put out some, we could call them propaganda videos about, you know, the, the shared struggle, let's say, between um, Yemen and Vietnam and, you know, uh, Southern American, South American countries, Latin American countries. And so uh, I think there's an attempt to build those connections. Um, and we'll see where that goes. We'll see if it, especially this particular stance has put them on the map, so to speak. Yemenis have been suffering for the last nine years with very little attention from the rest of the world, as you know, Kuri. Um, but I think this may be, this might bring attention to the plight of Yemenis and it might um, make those connections with the global south more more concrete. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a question from my colleague Phyllis. Um, Washington's escalation against Yemen right now is only one venue of the current escalations across the Middle East and the West Asia region right now. Uh, Iran, Pakistan, Hezbollah, Israel, um, uh, etc. 
Can you talk a bit about how Yemen um, and the Houthis, now in control of much of it, relate to other countries in the region, whether politically, militarily, economically, and diplomatically? Um, that's a good question. They don't have economic relationships with anyone because they've been under blockade. Um, there's no joint military exercises or anything like that. But like I said, they do receive some material support from Iran uh, and political support from Iran as well, but also from not the government of Lebanon, but Hezbollah. Um, they did not have the best relationship with Hamas. In fact, I think Hamas at some point, you know, voiced support for the Saudi-led coalition. And whatever actions that are that you're seeing now from Yemen is not in support of Hamas directly, but is it, they say it's in support of the Palestinian people. Just as many Palestinians will tell you that they don't support Hamas, of course, but they do support, you know, resistance against Israeli occupation, or they, you know, support, of course, their own liberation. Um, and so I think it's yet to be seen. The only country where you could say that they have a very clear relationship with is Oman. Oman is their only neighbor that has not bombed them for them, has not blockaded them. It actually closed its airspace to the US and the UK in the most recent attacks on Yemen um, in a show of, you know, again, neutrality at the very least and maybe solidarity uh, if you want to be a little bit more generous there. And they've also played a key role in uh, serving as a, as a negotiator between the Saudis and the Yemenis for the last several years. There were several attempts and several direct talks between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia uh, over the years that were initiated and facilitated by Oman. And Oman is seen as a as a neutral actor. They're neither here nor there. They've not supported the Saudi-led coalition, even though all of the, all those other countries in the region essentially have, um, and they've not supported um, the Houthis either, but have uh, allowed them to to come and to speak and to, you know, and to have these negotiations. Right, um, thank you. I've got this question from Eddie, uh, which is, uh, would the US have bombed Yemen anyway if, the, if there was no destruction um, of Gaza, uh, uh, given I think the, the fact that um, the attacks uh, adversely affect Egypt's economy and trade generally. Uh, after all, the U.S. has been bombing uh, Somalia long before this. Yeah, so Yemenis will tell you absolutely they have been bombing them through um, through Saudi Arabia, and uh, so the announcement even to start the Saudi-led coalition's war in Yemen was made in Washington D.C. in 2015 by the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. at the time. You know, the announcement was made in English, not in Arabic, and so. Through the lens of Yemenis, the, the, through their eyes, they've always seen the U.S. as being uh, equally responsible for their bombardment and blockade as the Saudis and the UAE over the last several years, almost a decade now. Um, so would they have bombed Yemen anyway? Well, they were already bombing them. Um, we just had a pause in these bombings in 2022 as a result of the ceasefire talks. Um, but, you know, fourth president in a row now to bomb Yemen. Bush was conducting... Uh, drone attacks on whoever he decided was a terrorist. So was President Obama. And uh, and then their full material support to the Saudi-led coalition resulted in Congress even saying that the U.S. is illegally at war in Yemen in 2019 when they've directed Trump to withdraw hostilities in Yemen through the War Powers Act. So um, Congress has recognized U.S. hostilities in Yemen as being uh, illegal. And that was only when they were refueling, let alone now when they're directly bombing Yemen. Right. Wow. Okay. We've got time for just one more um, question before we hand it over to Yasmin for um, a policy update. But so this, this question is from Timmy. It says, Yemen has a rich and inspiring history of leftist political movements. Can you speak to this history, um, you know, to the extent that we can in, in the time we have, uh, and its relationship to the current struggles that Yemen is facing? Yeah, I think this would require and absolutely require a whole talk in, it, in its own. Um, I'm from South Yemen, where um, we were colonized by the British for 128 years. And then um, as a result of Yemeni um, resilience and uh, uprisings, the British were forced to leave South Yemen after that much time had passed. 
And the, the reason Yemen is divided north and south is because of colonization. But there was always this eagerness to reconnect and you know reunite the two parts of the country. Now that unification has been fraught, but um, right after the British left, we had actually the Middle East's only to date Marxist-Leninist government um, I was born in the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, you know, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so we have this long history of um, leftist socialist movements, uh, an entire government that was, unfortunately, I think at the, uh, if it fell apart and it was forced into unity at the, um, as the Soviet Union was collapsing. So in late 89, when the Soviet Union, you know, was collapsing, the leaders in the South began negotiations with the North and kind of enacted this very quick unity in 1990. I think if we had given it some time, we would have seen more solidarity between North and South Yemen, but it was as a result of knowing that they weren't gonna be able to sustain that kind of system much longer with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But many of these groups still exist and have uh, been staunchly anti-interventionists and have even supported the Houthis in their cause. Um, and many of them did not and kind of broke off and have been calling for secession uh, from, from northern Yemen. But like I said, that's a topic in and of itself. Well, um, that just means that we're going to have to talk again soon. Um, Shireen, I can't thank you enough uh, for this just incredibly rich discussion. Um, so big, big gratitude. Um, and uh, well, I'll well, gonna, I'm going to turn it to Yasmin soon, but just wanted to um, really appreciate so much um, this conversation. Thank you so much for having me and for the great questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you to the audience too for these um, these really incredible questions. Before I hand it to um, Yasmin for a policy update, I did just want to, and I think that we dropped the link in the chat, but um, uh, remind folks that we have uh, an open letter to the White House for the U.S. to stop escalating its violence in the Middle East, including, um, of course, its belligerence in the Red Sea and toward Yemen. So um, this is an organizational sign-on. So uh, please uh, go ahead and check that out. And we're asking people to sign on by close of business uh, next Wednesday. So with that, we are so lucky to have Yasmin Tayeb, uh, who is the legislative and political director for Empower Change. And she's going to give us a policy update on what's happening on the Hill um, in relation to Yemen, uh, Gaza, and the unfolding violence in the Middle East. I guess, mean. Hey, Curry. Thank you so much for, for having me and um, for the great work that you, Phyllis, and your colleagues. And thank you so much for, for Shireen for, for the briefing on Yemen. Uh, so I just wanted to take uh, just a couple minutes to give a quick update on the uh, as I could say, the sad affairs of congressional affairs, on, specifically on Gaza, um, and a quick update on the vote that happened this Tuesday in the Senate, um, a little context around that, um, what we're expecting to happen next in the House and Senate, and how folks can kind of plug in and help out. Um, so for, for those that have been kind of involved in Senator Sanders' uh, 502B resolution. So this is the vote that happened on Tuesday. This is a resolution that Senator Sanders had introduced um, uh, last month in, in December. It was a privileged resolution, which meant that it was going to get a vote. He was going to be able to force a vote. Um, and it, because of kind of the nature of the resolution, it also meant that if it passed in the Senate, there's no need for a joint resolution in the House. Um, and it was a very simple resolution, as Senator Sanders had noted, right? It wasn't controversial. Um, the question before senators was simply, do you support the State Department, you know, ask, do you support asking the State Department whether human rights violations have been occurring um, during, you know, the, the recent assault on Gaza, the military offensive, um, using U.S. equipment or assistance? And as folks who kind of tuned in, we didn't even actually get to a vote um, on the underlying bill. Unfortunately, uh, senators voted 7211 to completely kill the, the measure, the effort. It was tabled. Um, it was incredibly frustrating. It was incredibly infuriating, appalling, honestly, um, because it, it, it signaled that 
not only are lawmakers still, when we're dealing with more than 30,000 um, Palestinians that have been killed uh, since October, over 12,000 children, I mean, two thirds are women and children, nearly 2 million have been displaced, right? We're, we're talking about over 100 days of this genocidal assault. And not only are lawmakers refusing to even do anything about it, but this measure was simply invoking and reinstating re current U.S. law, right? So it basically showed that the White House, I mean, the White House publicly opposed Senator Sanders' measure. Um, and it showed that they're not even willing to... Um, be in compliant with current existing law. The for, I mean, the, the FAA, the Foreign Assistance Act, simply states that um, the U.S. is not permitted to provide any security assistance to any government engaging in a pattern of human rights violations. That's existing law. And the fact that we can't even hold Israel accountable, um, and even when we, there's legitimate concerns and allegations that human rights violations and atrocities are being committed. Uh, I mean, there's a current ICJ case of genocide being um, filed against Israel. And it's just for me as advocates for Curry, Phyllis, I mean, all of us that have been working on these efforts, it's, it's infuriating. Um, but what I wanted to kind of note that you know, we need to continue to, to push our lawmakers to ensure that we hold, um, you know, our own government accountable, ensuring that um, any security assistance that's being provided to any country, including Israel, that it's in compliance with US laws. And we obviously know it's not right now, but there are other efforts kind of coming up. Um, I mean, the main ask right now has still been ensuring that you push your um, House member and senators to support a lasting ceasefire there are efforts uh, right now being led by Representative Tlaib in the House, uh, two letters that are actually closing early next week, next Tuesday. Um, one is being sent to the uh, GAO, one is being sent to Biden, and both of them are in regards to um, urging for assessments of, um, you know, Israel's Leahy law and, and conventional arms transfer policy these are like ensuring that we're in, they're in compliance um so if you're able to advocate on these letters uh ask your house member to sign on to them um there's going to be other efforts coming up as well but um but i just wanted to you know again make the case for the importance of kind of organizing at the grassroots level um back to the Bernie effort, because it was so just kind of last minute, um, a lot of folks, a lot of our members honestly didn't know what was going on. And I think a lot of folks also unfortunately kind of have written Bernie off because he has not come out in support of a ceasefire. So they've kind of also kind of ignored efforts he's, he's doing on Gaza. And I feel bad uh, really for our members and also for the Senator. Um, I think that you know, it could have gone better. Um, the 11 votes total on, on not killing the measure, I think was okay. We, I mean, I think it was actually better than what we thought it was going to be, which is unfortunate, but, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Just wanted to give a quick update on, um, on this week's vote and uh, if, if folks have any questions about what's coming up. Oh, thank you so much for that, Yasmin. And, um... You know, one thing really quickly, there was a question in the Q&A box about whether this is being recorded. And um, I think that we just uh, dropped the link to, uh, the, you know, yes, the recording will be made available. Um, uh, I have a question, actually, it, it comes from um, from um, our, my colleague Phyllis, about, it's about Yemen. Um, and one of the many um, problems with the U.S. bombing Yemen is that it's being done, the, US, the White House is doing it without congressional um, authorization. Um, and the question of the authorization of use of military force has come up in the past um, over the many years that the U.S. has um, been bombing Yemen and has supported Saudi bombing of Yemen. And so this question is, uh, do we know if anyone in Congress right now is raising questions about um, 
uh, congressional authorization for the current attack on Yemen. Yeah, I think um, you probably saw that immediately after the strikes. Uh, I mean, our, our champions, uh, progressive champions in the House in particular, kind of condemned the action. Um, you know, Representative Presley, Talib, and Elhan. Uh, so I know that there's there's talks around that, and there's some efforts potentially being planned. But I think it's it's just unfortunately it's it's because the two are related. There's a couple of things on the Gaza displacement um, that Representative Jayapal was working on that was just wrapped up. There's these two letters that Talib is doing, and I I know that there's a lot of concern about um, you know sidestepping Congress uh, around. Um, when we're talking about policies around um, foreign assistance and and arms, um, but at the at the moment right now, I'm not aware. But I I know it's it's kind of in the works. Thank you for that, Yasmin. Um, okay, we've got a few questions um, in the Q and A box, and we'll see what we can get to uh, in the in the few minutes we have left. First is uh, now that Bernie's um, uh, attempt did not move forward what bills in the House or Senate should activists focus on? So the one, I mean, folks can still focus on the ceasefire now resolution. I mean, this is the one that Representative um, Tlaib and Bush introduced last year. It has, I believe right now, a total of 19 co-sponsors, Representative Hank, Hank Johnson, most recently this week, um, joined on as a co-sponsor. So I know that Representative Tlaib's office is still asking the grassroots to push their membership um, to get their members to co-sponsor. Um, that's the, the main house vehicle. Um, right now, we're still in the offensive, I would say, for folks to, to, to still keep an eye out in terms of what's going to happen with the supplemental. So the supplemental, um, as folks may be aware, um, is this massive national security aid package that combines um, funding for, for Israel along with Ukraine, also has billions of dollars in funding for, for border enforcement. And the reason why it, it was stalled is, I mean, a lot of it was just political reasons. Republicans wanted a lot more <laughs> enforcement measure and, and policy measures, uh, riders included in the, in the package and I mean, that was great for us because it got stalled, but just wanted to kind of make sure folks keep an eye out on that. Once it's clear that it's moving in the Senate, we really need to mobilize quickly um, in trying to get as many calls and letters into the Senate um, to ensure they know that their constituents oppose uh, providing $14 billion in additional aid to um, Israel to continue its genocidal assault on Gaza. Uh, just wanted to uh, make sure that folks know that that's kind of our focus next in the Senate. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, so speaking of the Senate, and this goes back to, to Bernie's initiative, um, this question from Eddie, does Rand Paul's vote mean that other Republicans might join up or is this just Rand Paul? Yeah, great question. Um, unfortunately, I would I would have to say it's it's just Rand, <laughs> it's just Rand Paul. Yeah, so, so Rand Paul, typically does join a lot of efforts we do around um, uh, like oversight measures uh, in terms of arms, um, anything dealing with um, AUFF, AUMF issues, uh, he, he joins the efforts. Uh, I mean, we've also in the past had a couple other like lead in the past on, on some of these efforts, but unfortunately when we're talking about uh, Israel, it's, I'm not hopeful that will get other Republicans. <laughs> Thank you for that, that honest answer. Um, yeah. uh, so, okay, last question is from David. Um, the 10 Democrats uh, who did support this initiative uh, constitute 20% of the Democrats in the Senate. How can we press progressives about the huge disparity between Democratic constituents who are urging yeah. a ceasefire and elected Democrats who are still supporting arms shipments to Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to make a quick clarification. Um, so, so, so because there, there was actually no vote on um, 
Bernie's resolution, we, we don't know if those 10 other senators would have actually voted yes. So th there has been a number of examples in the Senate where on a motion to table, um, senators oppose tabling because they support having a debate and an actual vote. Um, so Schatz, after the, the motion to table put out a statement, he, he like missed the vote and he specifically said he would have opposed tabling it, but he wasn't clear whether he would have voted yes on the underlying bill. So just wanted to kind of clarify that the vote on the resolution could have actually been lower. Um, but, but, but with that said, um, absolutely correct is that there's a huge disparity in, in the sense that majority of voters, Republican and um, Democratic voters, support a ceasefire. The vast, vast majority of Democratic voters, I think, what is it, over 80% now that support a, a ceasefire. Um, but we're not seeing nearly the same reflected in, um, in our electeds. And you know, I mean, that's something that we continue to highlight in our messaging that our members of Congress are simply not listening to their constituents. And that's something that we need to drive home. Um, I mean, my organization alone, and this is just one group we've made since October 7th, we've sent and made over 600,000 calls to the House and Senate. Just imagine how many other organizations have been doing this. Millions and millions of calls and letters um, have been sent to both chambers. And I think that's incredible and that needs to continue. I think it's important that um, you know, House members and senators realize that this is not an issue that we are going to forget about. This is not something that we're just going to walk away from. Uh, every minute, every hour of the day, there are more children, more families being slaughtered um, in Gaza. And, you know, we are going to continue fighting. We are conti going to continue advocating um, until we get a ceasefire. Um, but I think that, you know, noting that discrepancy and disconnect is absolutely important with with your electeds. Well, Yasmin, can't thank you enough for this update and for what you do every day. Um, so thank you so much for, for this and for joining us. Um, and as we um, just wrap up, I just want to make an announcement uh, that, um, again, thank you to everybody who, who, who joined this conversation. Um, next Wednesday, we're going to be having another briefing, and it's going to be on the latest regarding South Africa's petition to the International Court of Justice uh, that Yasmin mentioned. Um, charging Israel with genocide. And so that will feature former UN official Craig Mokhyber, BDS National Committee, African coordinator Salah Hijazi, and our own um, uh, IPS's own Phyllis Bennis. That's next Wednesday at noon. Um, and uh, I think we just, yeah, we just dropped the link in the chat. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you so much to Yasmin, uh, to Shireen, and to all of you for joining. Mm -hmm.